As for those who are righteous, they shall be in the fire, wherein there shall be for them groaning and wailing, abiding therein for so long as the heavens and the earth endure, save as thy Lord wills. Surely thy Lord does whatsoever he wills. And as for those who are felicitous, they shall be in the garden, abiding therein for so long as the heavens and the earth endure, save as thy Lord wills, a gift uninterrupted. It is a fact that it is affirmed in the Quran that the existence of hell is eternal for those who are wretched. The question that constantly troubles our mind is, how can hell be eternal if sinners only committed temporal and limited sins? Furthermore, where is God's mercy which encompasses all things in the face of hellfire? In this episode, we are going to discuss Ibn Arabi's perspective on the chastisement in hell. If you find this video helpful, please also share it with others. And you can also help me out monetarily through PayPal or Patreon. According to Ibn Arabi, among the inhabitants of hell, only people of faith, regardless of their religion, will be initially punished for the sins they committed during their worldly life, but eventually they will enjoy heaven. Besides them, no one will leave hell. There are four groups of sinners who will eternally dwell in hell, and they are regarded as the true inhabitants of the hell fire. Those are the arrogant, polytheists, atheists, and hypocrites. The verses we have quoted to indeed indicate that those who are wretched will dwell eternally in hell. But it is not described as their abiding state, because a gift followed by an adjective uninterrupted awaits those who are felicitous. Additionally, we are also informed that surely thy Lord does whatsoever he wills, which is also highlighted by Ibn Arabi. Indeed, the Quran explicitly declares the matter related to hell as follows. Therein they shall abide, the chastisement shall not be lightened for them, nor shall they be granted respite. Then it shall be said unto the wrongdoers, taste the chastisement everlasting. So taste the chastisement for having forgotten the meeting with this your day. Verily we have forgotten you, and taste the chastisement everlasting for that which you used to do. Truly hell lies in ambush, a place unto which the rebellious return to tarry therein for ages. They taste therein neither coolness nor drink, save boiling liquid and a cold murky fluid, a fitting recompense. Once again, will God punish finite sins and wrongdoings with eternal and unlimited chastisement? Even though the sin of sick, ascribing partners to God in worship or in his role as creator, is considered to be a sin God will not forgive, will God punish them eternally, given that their sheikh in the world is really temporal? It seems that this is literally what is asserted in the Quran. Furthermore, another intriguing question has to be put forth. If it is said that the chastisement in the hell is intended to purify and to cleanse the souls of those who have sinned, wouldn't there be a point when their souls are already purified? making suffering in hell superfluous. Additionally, it's worth highlighting that the three verses in consideration clearly mention the experience of tasting eternal chastisement. Therefore, one can argue that these verses support the interpretation that the chastisement in hell may not be everlasting. Put differently, if hell is so intensely painful that even a small taste of it is excruciating, then it may not need to be eternal in its duration. In other words, the suffering in hell might be so severe that a brief or limited chastisement would suffice as a form of retribution or chastisement for one's sins. If tasting signifies a limited phenomenon, then the eternal and enlightening chastisement mentioned earlier would only persist during this period of testing. Why is this the case? 
in Ibn Arabi's own words, how could there be everlasting wretchedness? For be it from God that his wrath should take precedence over his mercy, or that he should make the embrace of his mercy specific after he had called it general. Ibn Arabi's statement is clearly based on Quranic verses among which are my mercy encompasses all things. He has prescribed mercy for himself. As such, if God is, as the Quran states, quote unquote, the most merciful of merciful beings, then we should expect him to be more compassionate and merciful than any created being. So we cannot imagine how merciful God is to all sinners. Moreover, truly God forgives all sins. But what about God's other names, particularly those signifying subjugation, domination, and severity? Ibn Arabi contends that these divine names should be considered alongside all of God's names that indicates mercy, pardon, clemency, and forgiveness. So what remains are the names, the all-merciful and the all-compassionate. Moreover, Ibn Arabi argues that the divine threats mentioned in each chapter should be viewed in conjunction with the Basmala formula in the name of God the All-Merciful, the All-Compassionate that precedes all chapters except for At-Tawbah. Quote, Righteousness derives from the divine wrath, while felicity derives from the divine good pleasure. Good pleasure is the unfolding of mercy without end, but wrath will be cut off. The divine form by which human beings were created is fundamentally rooted in mercy. As mercy is an intrinsic aspect of Al-Haq's essential attribute, while wrath is merely a secondary attribute. This signifies that the essence of reality at its core is characterized by mercy, love, and bliss, and they must manifest themselves. Ibn Arabi asserts that the ultimate outcome will be at mercy. Consequently, reality can be likened to a circle. Its beginning was mercy and its end goes back to its beginning. In contrast, wrath is a transient and accidental. Furthermore, because God's wrath is an accidental thing, it is enveloped, constrained, and dominated by His mercy. Ibn Arabi hence maintains wrath disposes itself only through mercy's ruling property. Mercy sends out wrath as it will. Even though the four groups of sinners are considered to have committed significant transgressions, Ibn Arabi contends that divine mercy will also embrace them. This is underscored in the Quran, my mercy encompasses all things. In his analysis of the Quranic verse, truly those who affront God and his messenger, God has cursed them in his life and hereafter, and has prepared for them a humiliating chastisement. Ibn Arabi states that thanks to God's attributes patient, Asopur, one of God's names, God waits for the unjust and disobedient in the hereafter to give their retribution. However, because God's mercy takes precedence over wrath, in the end, nothing will be untouched by the divine mercy. Quote, One of the causes of chastisement is affront, but affront has disappeared, so there is no escape from mercy and the removal of wrath. Inescapably, mercy will include everything through God's bounty, God willing. It cannot be denied that God is the best bestower of mercy, and we have no evidence that he is the best bestower of chastisement. Ibn Arabi references a hadith stating that the right of God over his servants is their belief in his oneness, while the right of the servants is to be rewarded with heaven if they uphold God's right. He then mentions a Quranic verse that says, The recompense of an evil is an evil like unto it. Yet whosoever pardons and sets matters right, his reward is with God. Given God's supremacy over his creation, Ibn Arabi contends that God will pardon, show patience, and set things right. Consequently, the ultimate outcome will be determined by God's mercy in the two abodes. Mercy will encompass individuals regardless of their whereabouts. Therefore, it is reasonable to expect that God's threats will be overridden by forgiveness. 
quotes, the final issue will be at mercy for the actual situation inscribes a circle. The end of the circle curves back to its beginning and joins it. The end has the property of the beginning and that is nothing but wujud. Mercy takes precedence over Ruth. Because the beginning was through mercy, Ruth is an accident and accidents disappear. So the question arises, when will God's Ruth towards his servants in hell come to an end? According to Ibn Arabi's perspective, this will happen at the culmination of the Day of Resurrection, which is expected to endure for around 50,000 years. Following that, Divine Mercy will become fully manifest in all its glory. As Divine Mercy necessitates both a subject and an object, it is most appreciated when the object can recognize it. Taking this into consideration, Ibn Arabi alludes to the innate disposition of human as well as the primordial covenant taken by God as mentioned in the Quran and when thy Lord took from the children of Adam from their loins their progeny and met them bear witness concerning themselves am I not your Lord they said yeah we bear witness lest you should say on the day of resurrection truly of this we were heedless Thus Ibn Arabi says, every infant is simply born in the state of the innate disposition. And the innate disposition is acknowledged by God through servitude. It is an obedience upon an obedience. Hence, Ibn Arabi's argument is that the individuals in hell will undergo suffering until they ultimately acknowledge their role as servants of God. Initially, the chastisement experienced by the wretched is a consequence of their own actions as they contest and question the motives behind God's deeds. Nevertheless, their state of wretchedness will eventually come to an end as they put an end to their discord and deviation from God. Quote, they will pluck the fruit of their words at the primordial covenant, yeah, we bear witness. They will be like those who submit to God after apostasy. The authority of yes will rule over everything and finally give rise to their felicity after the wretchedness that had touched them in the measure in which they had made claims. The property of yes will never leave them from its own moments at infinitum in this word, in the barzakh, and in the afterward. Furthermore, due to God's justice, the inhabitants of hell will eventually comprehend their situation as it is God who decides their place of dwelling. Ultimately, what holds significance is not which abode one finds themselves in, but rather what aligns with their inner constitution and what their soul truly desires. Quote, Please is nothing but what is accepted by the constitution and desired by the soul. Locations have no effect in that. Wherever agreeableness of nature and attainment of desire are found, that is the person's please. According to Ibn Arabi, God's mercy will encompass those in hell because in the afterlife, everyone will obediently and devotedly worship God through essential worship without any distractions of accidental worship. Consequently, God will find content in all individuals. In this context, Ibn Arabi interprets the Quranic passage, God being content with them and they being content with him, as applying to everyone, not exclusively to the inhabitants of heaven. This state of contentment, however, is only achieved after the people of hellfire and the people of heaven settle into their permanent abodes. It is at that point that God will make them content with what they have been granted and with their respective abodes which they will prefer over the other. So hell is eternal because its inhabitants are also eternal which are the four groups of sinners we mentioned earlier. However, the chastisement within hell is not eternal. Quote, Certainly, God does not inflict chastisement at the outset of an action. Instead, he punishes as a consequence of an action. Indeed, there is no mercy in chastisement except as a reward for purification. If not for the purpose of purification, there would never be any chastisement. Ibn Arabi's statement establishes that chastisement is not an end in itself. 
That's why chastisement is always given to someone at the end of their action as a consequence of the sins they have committed, not at the beginning before the sinful act occurs. This contradicts mercy which is given by God from the beginning to the end, as mercy always encompasses everything. Quote, the fire seeks only those human beings whose divine form has not become manifest outwardly and inwardly. This clarifies why Ibn Arabi consistently emphasizes that even the fire is fundamentally a manifestation of God's mercy and its purpose is to cleanse those who find themselves within it. The purification of individuals involves eliminating from them everything that goes against their innate disposition of it raw. So in reality, borrowing Ibn Arabi's unconventional perspective, God's mercy is manifested in two forms, mercy and chastisement, or both can occur simultaneously. The first one is certainly easier to understand, but what about the second one, which is mercy in the form of chastisement? Ibn Arabi explains that this happens when mercy can only be realized by causing pain to its recipients, who is the one receiving this kind of mercy. Ibn Arabi provides two examples to help us understand this. First, as stated in Hadith Qudsi, God never hesitates to do something except when taking the life of a believer to return them to him, even though the person dislikes death, and God has to call them back. In this context, death is something painful. It has a chastisement. While meeting God, it as the mercy will not occur except through death. Second, it is like a doctor having to hurt a patient to treat an infected wound for the patient's well-being. Drawing from the verse, my mercy encompasses all things, and the Hadith could see, mercy takes precedence over wrath. We can see that in reality, even in chastisement, there is mercy, which Ibn Rabi understands as a means of purifying the souls of those undergoing the chastisement. And this is how mercy is realized. Thus, the chastisement in hell is a reward completely outside the context of vengeance, which is highly unlikely for the all-merciful and all-compassionate God and therefore it will not last forever, especially for those who are believers. Ibn Arabi's viewpoints like this is of course in contrast to the views of the majority of Muslim scholars. In the Fusus, Ibn Arabi once defines chastisement as the absence of mercy, which may seem contradictory to what is stated elsewhere, that chastisement itself is a form of God's mercy. However, it should be remembered that in providing such a definition, Ibn Arabi is emphasizing the direct effect of chastisement, which is the suffering experienced, while the positive outcome of chastisement, namely the purification of the soul, clearly implies that mercy encompasses chastisement itself. Indeed, Ibn Arabi consistently challenges his readers to think outside the established norms. In this context, that chastisement is not eternal, Ibn Arabi sharply scrutinizes the meaning of chastisement, azab, in Arabic. The root of this word, ayn dalba, actually connotes sweetness, agreeableness, and pleasantness. As such, he states in Fususul Hikam, hell is called a chastisement due to the sweetness of its food. What Ibn Arabi wants to emphasize is that the repeated use of the word azab in the Quran to refer to chastisement in the afterlife is nothing but good news from God because mysteriously the word adab implies that the suffering in hell will become sweet when enveloped by mercy for those who receive the chastisement. The severe and terrifying chastisement they initially experience will undoubtedly lead those being punished to experience this sweetness. In elsewhere, Ibn Arabi asserts that which causes pain is named chastisement as good news from God. Inescapably, you will find that everything through which you suffer is sweet when mercy envelops you in the fire. Ibn Arabi explains that this shift from chastisement to enjoyment will begin when the wretched accept their destiny and give up 
any hope of living hell. Then, in a powerful demonstration of divine mercy, 19 garden angels of hell will join the angels responsible for inflicting chastisement, and the flames will turn cool, similar to what happened for Abraham and they will experience bliss. Following this initial bliss, their suffering will fade away and they will start to perceive their everlasting chastisement as something sweet and pleasing. Many mistakenly believe that Ibn Arabi completely denies the reality of chastisement in the afterlife. This assumption is entirely incorrect, considering that the attributes of God are eternal and wrath is one of his attributes, then hell must be eternal. And the state of chastisement must also endure for the true inhabitants of hell. The idea that mercy will ultimately triumph could imply that God no longer possesses the attributes of Ruth. However, it's essential to remember that God fundamentally has two hands and his reality remains constant. Nevertheless, human beings perceive God's wrath as a form of chastisement, and this chastisement does indeed come to an end. Ibn Arabi clarifies that while the chastisement ends, it will remain within the realm of imagination, as the comprehension of its opposite is necessary to experience bliss. Quote, no chastisement will remain in the fire except imaginal chastisement within the presence of imagination, in order that the properties of the divine names may subsist. A name necessitates only the manifestation of the property that its reality demands. It does not specify the presence nor the individual since that is a property of the name's knowing and desiring. Hence, whenever the property of the avenger becomes manifest within an imaginal body or a corporeal body or in anything else, its rights are fulfilled through the manifestation of its property and effectivity. So the divine names continue to exercise effectivity and determine properties for all eternity in the two abodes and the inhabitants of the two abodes never leave them. It's important to note that God's attribute of wrath is not pure wrath, but rather divine wrath, as pure wrath does not exist, and divine wrath is a part of divine mercy. This indicates that in any case, wrath is only realized for the sake of mercy itself. However, even though the inhabitants of hell eventually experience chastisement as sweetness and happiness within it, there is one supreme happiness that has never been and will never be attained or experienced by the true inhabitants of hell, which is witnessing God without any veil. And this is in fact the true chastisement within hell. Quote, will God to disclose himself to them in the fire, given their precedent's evil doing and their worthiness for chastisement, that benevolent self-disclosure would yield nothing but shame before God for what they had done. And shame is chastisement, but chastisement's period has come to an end. Hence, they will not know the joy of witnessing and vision, so they will have bliss while being veiled. The goal is bliss and it has been achieved with the fail. But for whom? How can the bliss of the vision of God be compared to bliss with the veil? Nay, surely on that day, they will be veiled from their Lord. God knows best. Thank you so much for watching.